Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the weekly Great Manchester briefing. Uh, we thought we'd surprise you all this week by being just about on time, only a, a minute late. So thanks very much indeed for joining us. And without any further ado, I will hand over to Sir Richard Lees, uh, who will take you through the latest data. Richard. Uh, thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, start as always with the uh, prevalence uh, uh, slide. We'll see that uh, overall the numbers continue to go down, gone down. Uh, something just over 20, uh, just over 10 percent over the past uh, uh, seven, seven days. A little bit above the national average, but fairly close to the national uh, average. Rate of decline is, is relatively good now. Uh, I guess slightly concern about Bolton, which isn't quite going down at the same uh, same pace, um, but we'll uh, uh, we'll clearly want to be keeping an eye on that and see if we can investigate whether there are any particular reasons for that. We haven't got any at the moment, by the way. Uh, if you want to move to the next slide, uh, this is the age profile, and you'll see that even when you get to the right hand end, although it's generally lighter, the darkest parts are still uh, more or less in that. 30 to 44 age range, uh, working age uh, population. And um, from the point of view of pressures on uh, uh, hospitals and uh, particularly on intensive care, uh, that is probably, if, if we're going to have cases at all, that's the places to uh, have them. Uh, the very top line, the over 65, you see is very much going to uh, uh, the lighter yellow across the piece. And that's, again, very much where we want it to, to be and for that. Uh, trend to continue. Move to the next one. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that when we get to the vaccination uh, slide. Uh, this is the uh, testing per 100,000 population. You see uh, relatively high levels of testing, which ought to be the case because we are, uh, as well as PCR testing, symptomatic testing, we are uh, now doing again large amounts of uh, asymptomatic testing for a whole range of people. Uh, next week, those figures or, or week after those figures will jump up very, very significantly because we are, of course, now doing the intensive targeted uh, testing and in Moss Side and uh, Hume. And I, I suspect we, we might see that again. Uh, it seems to be one of the real strengths that we've got in uh, the UK, which is a strength in genomics, which allows us to uh, identify, contain and check that we've got the antidotes for variants and mutations on a very rapidly uh, rapid basis. So we might see that elsewhere in the city region if uh, new variants, new mutations uh, appear. It's nothing to uh, panic about for people in the area. Uh, the lockdown rules don't change. People who need vaccines, we're still encouraging to get uh, uh, vaccines, but this is part of I think a fairly sophisticated strategy to be able to contain new variants. Move on to the uh, next one. Uh, this is, I think, uh, good news. Again, uh, care home residents, the number continues to go down. When we do get to vaccines, say that we've now uh, offered to uh, vaccinations to all care home uh, residents. A uh, very large percentage have taken the, uh, the vaccine. So that ought to ensure that this number, if anything, continues to go uh, go down. We're certainly not expecting it to go up uh, at the moment. Uh, move on. This is what's happening in uh, our hospitals. And if we look at uh, uh, admissions that uh, for Greater Manchester, I think yesterday it's around 80. Uh, they're probably about uh, 20% down on where they were a week ago, and they seem to be stabilising that, that direction. That trend seems to be stabilising. So I think that emissions is good. Uh, it's not in this slide, but we've done really, really well on uh, discharges, which has taken a lot of pressure off uh, the hospitals as well. Uh, intensive care, we're now talking about probably about six to nine COVID patients going in. Uh, 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 where we were and the COVID critical uh, different figure to the one, uh, one there but a, a, again the trend for that is down and uh, we expect that trend to uh, continue 
And I think there's still an expectation that we won't be able to return to electives, even if everything goes well, probably until towards the end of uh, March, because I think one of the things we have to bear in mind, the intensity of what's been going over the last couple of months, that uh, uh, clinical staff are actually pretty exhausted. Uh, care staff involved in discharges are pretty exhausted as, as well, that, uh, uh, that there are all sorts of ways that uh, uh, systems can fall over and people going sick because they're overworked is, is one of them. So we're going to have to build in some recovery time. Part of that is that over the next few weeks uh, that we do expect in critical care ratios to start returning to normal. Uh, and again, that will help take pressure off uh, the staff there. Uh, move on. I think we've got uh, vaccines, vaccines next. It is vaccines. Uh, 539,494, it's probably over, I think it's over 600,000 now if we have the up to date uh, figures that we have been doing really well on uh, uh, vaccines. So really well done to all the staff that have been involved in, in that and the enormous number of volunteers that have been helping with that uh, as well. It's been fantastic effort. Uh, in category four, uh, uh, the, the high risk people of all ages, uh, that number has gone up enormously uh, because uh, a lot a lot more people have been classified into that category. So uh, we, we were originally talking about 542, 550,000 people uh, that we need to do. It's now near 650,000 people we need to do in the top four, uh, four categories. But I can say with some confidence, with the exception of high risk people of all ages, because it's only in the last week that that number has gone up in all of the other people in the top four categories. Uh, we're fairly confident now that everybody has been offered a vaccination and the take up of uh, that offer has been, uh, I think, uh, reason. Well, it's, it's been pretty high. We are talking about uh, around about 8% in all categories of people accepting uh, the vaccine and clearly we are working continue to work to get that number up and um, the more people know people have had the vaccine the more hesitancy uh, reduces so we move a lot of people who were hesitant are now taking uh, get, getting the vaccine and, and clearly we will continue to offer it to all of the over 70 year olds because this is the group that has most uh, sig most significant difference to that pressure on the uh, uh, the health system so uh, uh, and really, really good uh, outcomes at the moment uh, from that across the whole of the city region. And if we move on, move on slide. Um, and I'm going to stop speaking now and I'm going to hand back to Andy. Thanks very much, Richard. Richard. And just to echo what you said about our thanks to all of the staff and particularly those volunteers that are helping us on the vaccination program. It's an amazing, amazing effort. And uh, I think everyone in those groups will be offered a vaccine by next week. So, you know, that that is a huge, huge achievement. Um, looking though towards um, the 22nd of February and the government's announcements, um, we have been asked to sort of feed in our views and uh, I met uh, with the 10 leaders and uh, all of the GM system yesterday to discuss uh, what we feed in uh, to the government, particularly on the question of what follows national lockdown. Um, and the first thing that we did yesterday was just um, go through some lessons learned uh, from uh, 2020. And that top table in the, in the chart uh, picks that up. Um, what this shows is obviously, um, the date of the first lockdown when it began to be uh, released um, and then finally getting to July with the pubs reopening what you can see there is the case rate um, in Greater Manchester London and uh, the England average and we have always maintained that the um, uh, the case rate was too high here when the first lockdown was lifted uh, and these figures bear that out which had the effect of trapping us in um, restrictions uh, for the second half of 2020 because the the numbers uh, never went uh, down as low as we would have wanted them to uh, and consequently we, we saw that, uh, that that never-ending 
uh, period of, of, of restrictions, which was so hard for our for our residents. So obviously there's a debate now building again about um, is it back to tiers or is it back uh, or is it to remain in a national uh, position? If we could actually just just keep on the graph if that's on the, the chart, if that's OK. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, that, that debate is obviously. Uh, we, we were originally talking about 542, 550,000 people uh, that we need to do. It's now near 650,000 people we need to do now uh, for uh, four categories. But I can say with some confidence, with the exception of high risk people of all ages, because it's only in the last week that that number's gone up, in all of the other people in the top four categories, gone up, in all of the other people in the top four categories, uh, we're fairly confident now that everybody has been offered a vaccination and the take up of uh, that offer has been, uh, I, I think, uh, reason, well, it's, it's been pretty high. We are talking about uh, around about 8% in all categories of people accepting uh, the vaccine. And clearly, we are working, continue to work to get that number up. Um, the more people know people have had the vaccine, the more hesitancy uh, reduces. So we move a lot of people who were hesitant are now taking uh, get, getting the vaccine. And clearly, we will continue to offer it to all of the over 70 year olds because this is the group that has most uh, sig most significant difference to that pressure on the uh, uh, the health system. So, uh, uh, really, really good uh, outcomes at the moment uh, from that across the whole of the city region. And if we move on. Move on slide. Um, and I'm going to stop speaking now and I'm going to hand back to Andy. Thanks very much, Chair Richard. And just to echo what you said about our thanks to all of the staff and particularly those volunteers that are helping us on the vaccination program. It's an amazing, amazing effort. And uh, I think everyone in those groups will be offered a vaccine by next week. So, you know, that that is a huge, a huge achievement. Um, Looking though towards um, the 22nd of February and the government's announcements, um, we have been asked to sort of feed in our views and uh, I met uh, with the 10 leaders and uh, all of the GM. System yesterday to discuss uh, what we feed in uh, to the government, particularly on the question of what follows national lockdown. Um, and the first thing that we did yesterday was just um, go through some lessons learned uh, from uh, 2020. And that top table in the in the chart uh, picks that up. Um, what this shows is obviously um, the date of the first lockdown, when it began to be uh, released um, and then finally getting to July with the pubs reopening. What you can see there is the case rate. Um, in Greater Manchester, London and uh, the England average and we have always maintained that the um, uh, the case rate was too high here when the first lockdown was lifted uh, and these figures bear that out which had the
the effect of trapping us in um, restrictions uh, for the second.
Uh, apologies, colleagues, for the interruption. I was tempting fate, I think, at the start by saying it was all going uh, so well, but we're back and we hope you can uh, can see us again uh, as well. Um, I was just going to introduce a slide uh, for you, which uh, is intended to inform the debate about the 22nd of February and where do we go from here. So uh, Greater Manchester has been asked by the government to feed its views in uh, to the government. And uh, I met with the 10 leaders yesterday and others in the Greater Manchester system to discuss uh, our position. And it's as Sir Richard said last week that we support a phased national release uh, from lockdown. And I hope this slide helps make the case for that, learning the lessons from what happened in 2020. So if we look at the first lockdown, obviously uh, in the earlier part of last year, you will see there that um, the lockdown was lifted when case numbers were significantly higher here than they were in other parts uh, of the country and we would argue that that led uh, to um, a significant uh, amount of infection in our 10 districts which then carried on circulating and then by the middle of the year came to a position where restrictions were imposed and we, we were unable uh, to escape uh, those restrictions partly because tiers are not effective in turning uh, infection rates significantly downwards. So that brings us now to the to the position that we're in uh, in 2021. And if you look at the numbers there <clears throat> for earlier this week, firstly, you will see that they are much higher than the numbers that we had last year. Um, higher here than London and the England uh, position, but not massively so. Um, but at the same time, we also have new new strains around, uh, which is a very different context to the one that we were in last year. So the main message from us is that tiers didn't work in our view, and the, re the risk is of repeating the mistake of last year, that we lift lockdown too early for the north of England, return to tiers, and then trap parts uh, of uh, the country and parts of the north in those ineffective tiers for much of 2021. And that is something we uh, believe must be uh, avoided. Uh, when new strains are around, it makes sense to move at the pace of the slowest rather than what happened last year, which was knocked out, lockdown was released, looking at the, uh, the figures in the place that was kind of first experiencing the growth in cases, London and the South East. We cannot make that uh, mistake this year because if we do, it will be to trap um, parts of the North in, in ineffective tiers again for large parts of 2021. And that is not something that we believe um, is, is right or fair. Um, and so we would say start with schools in early March, but then there should be a phased uh, release from lockdown as and when it's safe to do so, bringing sectors back that can be brought back safely, but leaving in national financial support systems for those who will take longest uh, to return. So with that, I, I will now hand over to Baroness uh, Beverly Hughes. Uh, Bev. uh, Hello, Baroness. Uh, Thank you very much, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to touch on uh, a few updates, obviously on the COVID compliance and enforcement picture, as we see it this week, uh, the situation in uh, the fire service and the police service, the update on the crime support line, and uh, an initial response to the government's uh, announcement uh, just this morning on further funding and arrangements in relation to fire safety in high rise buildings. So firstly, on the, the COVID in enforcement front um, compliance, the report I made last week that there seemed to have been a reduction in the number of very large gatherings, I'm afraid was very short lived um, because we've seen uh, an increase again over the past week. I'm talking about the week up to the Monday just gone and particularly uh, over the weekend. We issued 240 fixed penalty notices during that time, 180 over the weekend itself. Most of those have been in relation as, as has been usual to um, house parties and gatherings, but uh, again, as I say, uh, an increase uh, of those in the proportion that were very large gatherings. And, um, you know, a few particular ones, there's been a lot of media coverage uh, 
in any event of the incident at the cafe uh, in, in Burnage, uh, which led to a physical uh, altercation and uh, the 25 fixed penalty notices of uh, 800 pounds were uh, issued there. The owner of that cafe has now had three uh, fixed penalty notices doubling each time, so has been fined a total of £7,000 and uh, the City Council is looking to close those, those premises. Um, we've also had uh, more activity uh, on the party front from students than we, we were getting. Uh, that, that seems to have revised uh, quite a bit over the weekend with Manchester University and Manchester Metropolitan uh, students, uh, as I say, quite a lot of gatherings, including a large one on Saturday, uh, where 14 fixed penalty notices uh, were, were, were no, sorry, 25 fixed penalty notices of £800 were issued. Um, business compliance is generally good, but there were some um, exceptions to that. Uh, several gyms were found to be open uh, and operating in response uh, to calls from members of the public uh, and other sorts of businesses uh, illegally operating too but but generally from businesses uh, as has been the case uh, it's been it's been fairly compliant um, the situation in GMP uh, the sickness absence from sickness and self-isolation combined across the force altogether has stabilized at around five percent now um, but it remains 16 percent in the call handling branch uh, that's 133 staff there uh, are, are not at work because of sickness or self-isolating um, and that is causing significant um, increases in in the answer time for for 101 obviously as i said before we prioritize 999 calls um, fire service there are no particular issues regarding staff absences there uh, I wanted to say something about the crime support line just briefly. Um, there's been 240 uh, calls into that line, resulting in 127 formal reports to GMP, all of which are being uh, tracked and examined uh, and monitored. But over the last few weeks, the number of calls coming in has, has dwindled significantly. There have been no new calls. They've been people ringing about items they've, they've rung about before. So we will in the next couple of weeks be looking to exit from that dedicated line, uh, but there will be links into the existing arrangements, into victim support and into the other channels through which people can contact the police. But we will put out a full details of that uh, when, we, when we're ready to announce that uh, formally. And then just finally, uh, on the government's announcement today, uh, an extra three and a half billion pounds uh, added to the one and a half billion pounds for fire safety uh, in high rise and other tall, tall buildings. Um, we're still looking at the detail of that, but our initial response uh, from the fire service is that actually in terms of the scale of the problem, um, that funding, albeit welcome in itself, five billion, uh, is, is nowhere near sufficient to tackle to tackle this, this problem. And you know, the arbitrary height of, of 18 metres for a high rise building, we, we feel is not right either. If you recall, we had an awful fire at the Cube in, in Bolton. Um, that building, according to government uh, thresholds, was not classed as high rise. Um, it was just under 18, given the way they measure it. Um, our criteria for a high rise is six, stor six storeys and the Cube was six storeys. Uh, an example, perhaps, of a developer working around the planning and building regulations to bring in a building that didn't quite meet the 18 metre threshold, but nonetheless, in our terms and in anybody's terms, uh, was, was high rise. Um, I think that um, the other issue is that the issue of fire safety is about much more than just cladding. Um, and that doesn't seem to have been uh, encompassed in the government's uh, uh, announcement at all. And of course, people for uh, in buildings that don't meet the 18 metre threshold, they won't be given funding directly. They will only be eligible uh, for loans. And we think that's going to cause a lot of hardship to, to an awful lot of people. 
so that, that's our initial response, but we'll, we'll look at the detail uh, of what the government is saying and, uh, and refine that uh, in the next few days. So I think that's, that's it from me, Andy. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and just to pick up on your um, on your last point um, about the unfairness of what's been announced today with this 18 meter put off um, grants for people above it, loans for people below it. We know from the work that we did on the high rise task force uh, in Greater Manchester that there are 16 buildings in Greater Manchester below 18 meters which are unsafe. Um, so that is thousands of people in those buildings who tonight are facing the choice of um, living with unsafe cladding for the foreseeable future or paying uh, a cladding tax that they will be uh, very uh, much unable to afford. And that is an, an unacceptable position uh, for people who've already um, suffered a great deal uh, in the last few years to be, to be put in. We don't think it's fair and therefore the campaign to support those residents uh, will go on and that's the message I would very much want to send to them today. You know, it, it, they didn't measure their building when they bought it, they, they bought a building in good faith that it was safe and it has proved not to be so and the scheme should extend uh, in exactly the same way to them as has been rightly provided for, for people uh, in high rise buildings. I'm just going to finish on homelessness if I may uh, very briefly before turning to your questions um, <clears throat> because um, uh, we have uh, again the, the position, the possible position of the ending of the eviction ban. Uh, we know that the Prime Minister was asked about this today and refused to say whether or not um, it, 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 uh, the extension of the ban will continue and we're looking at the prospect now where, where it will end in the next few days. That's cause of great concern for us here in Greater Manchester given that we have over 520 people in a bed every night, um, hundreds more, so around a thousand people in a bed every night and some of our everyone in uh, accommodation. And then as Sir Richard and other council leaders will tell you, thousands more people in temporary accommodation. So the, the, the system that we have to support people in housing crisis is, is really at, at capacity and we simply would not be able to cope with significant numbers uh, coming coming new onto the streets if we see the end of the eviction the eviction ban so we make the appeal again on the government uh, to to uh, extend uh, the ban um, and therefore help us manage what is a very challenging uh, position uh, within within our homelessness uh, services right now just more positively if i may just to turn to a a couple of graphs to provide um, an update for you uh, on where we are with with um, with rough sleeping in Greater Manchester. Uh, there was a count carried out by our councils uh, recently in January um, and the latest position was, is that we have 71 uh, people uh, sleeping rough which is a reduction on what we were seeing at the back end of last year and I think it reflects the opening of extra winter uh, support uh, for for people. It got down as low as um, 50 in the spring of last year, uh, but this is continued progress and um, we are going to be uh, offering everybody who has come into accommodation over the winter uh, an option uh, onwards. So uh, we are really uh, doing everything we can to, to support uh, people on their journey away, away from the streets. And I'm very proud actually of everything that's going on in Greater Manchester. There's been a massive uh, effort to improve our response to rough sleeping and homelessness. And I think it is really beginning to show in the figures. And linked to that, if I could just finally um, give you a quick update on housing first in Greater Manchester. Uh, and the reason for showing you this slide is because today it uh, successfully rehoused uh, uh, its 200th um, uh, person in their own, their own tenancy. So this is under the government pilot, the government three year pilot. Um, we're in the middle of that pilot right now and uh, as of today 200 people have been uh, rehoused in their own tenancy and those two further figures there I think really speak to the success of, of housing first in Greater Manchester. We, we've, ha we've had nobody evicted uh, from, their, from their tenancy and 88% have been successfully sustained and 
we just want to, to, to uh, show you those figures to say we're proud of what's been achieved and everybody who's worked on the Greater Manchester Housing First pilot, uh, yeah, we, we are really proud of what you've achieved. But also to say to the government as we look to improve the national response to homelessness coming out of this crisis, please make Housing First uh, permanent um, and uh, move it beyond a pilot because it is clearly working uh, and we think it now needs to be adopted nationally and permanently. So I'll leave it there. Ross, I will uh, hand back to you. I know Sir Richard has to leave us at three, so uh, probably we'll take some health questions uh, first. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'll take two questions uh, for Sir Richard uh, uh, initially. First is from Eloise at Hits Radio. Uh, Sir Richard, the government was aiming to get the top four vulnerable groups vaccinated by next week. Um, obviously you referred to it in the slide, but how is that going in GM? Uh, will that be achieved? And do you think the target has made a difference to the speed at which people have been getting vaccinated. And I'll just ask one other at the same time, if that's all right, from Nigel Barlow, just slightly further down at 2.30. It was reported today that a return to normal service in hospitals would take more than a year. How do you feel about that? GM hospitals are placed post pandemic and with the region having some autonomy in future decision making, what do you think needs to be done? Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. First of all, on uh, uh, up again, uh, Eloise's question. I think I said it in the uh, uh, opening remarks that we think we've pretty much hit that target uh, already, uh, in that we've offered a, a vaccine to all of those top four uh, groups, with the exception of, of one, which I, again I talked about, which was the high risk group. And if you compare this week's slides with last week's slides, you will see the high risk group has gone from uh, it, it's around about 12,830 uh, last week. It is now 117,243. So that's the scale of the additional number of people who have been classified into uh, that group. And I don't think we can be uh, certain that we will have reached all that, those people within the last few days that we've uh, had them in the top four categories. And there may well be people missed, and I'm sure we'll get reports of be people being missed. So we're now in the process of going around uh, all the over 70s and try to remind G people off and try and get everybody in, into that pile. But in terms of meeting the government's target, we think we've pre pretty much met that already. Um, does the target may make a difference? Well, uh, I can answer that two ways. I think the answer is yes, because uh, the target. Uh, really had an impact on uh, NHS uh, England and their supply chain to get the vaccines to us. Uh, so I think it had an impact from that point of view. I'll also say that if we'd had a bigger supply of vaccine, we would have been able to do more people as well, that we've not used all the capacity that we've had uh, over the past five, six weeks. Uh, going down to uh, uh, Nigel's question, uh, one of the We've talked about this before. One of the inevitable impacts of the pressure on ICU from COVID is that a large number of other people have had treatments uh, postponed and uh, certainly electives. There is, we've gone from in some areas to waiting lists of zero to 20,000. I can put a time how long it's going to take to get those lists down to normal, but it's certainly going to take time. And of course, we are. Uh, going to be returning to normal with exactly the same staff uh, who've been dealing with the COVID crisis uh, as, as well. This is uh, uh, not just about whether we've got autonomy or not. This is simply about uh, the very real pressures the system has been under that the people within that system have been uh, uh, under and it will inevitably take time to recover from that. Thanks Richard. This question from Helen Pitt at The Guardian um, stressed, uh, so I'll put it to you in the first instance and then I'll put it to Andy uh, as well. Uh, why is Greater Manchester vaccinated more under 70s, 180,000 people as of the 31st of January, than anywhere else in England apart from Cumbria and the North East? Do you know how many of those 180,000 are clinically extremely vulnerable or health and social care workers? Well, we are starting to, uh, to get data uh, now, which is we talked about that before. It's really, really uh, important, but uh, we're not as you won't be able to answer that question at the moment. We simply do not have data 
uh, with that level of refinement. Uh, what I can tell you, though, uh, Helen, is that if you add up the number of uh, healthcare workers, the number of social care workers, the number of high risk people of all ages, and um, the care home residents and staff. So uh, if you, you obviously have to discount a little bit for residents, uh, that number is bigger than 180,000. Uh, so uh, we think, we, well, we know for, for those staff that we have offered 100% of them a vaccine has been very high uh, uh, take up. So I would expect that if not all, the vast majority of that 180,000 are within those uh, top four priority group categories. Thanks. I'll bring Andy on that one as well. It's only briefly just to, to add, um, Helen, that obviously the category with high risk people of all ages has been expanded, so that might partly explain your uh, your question. Um, also, though, that we've made really good good progress, uh, as Sir Richard said earlier, working through the top top four groups. So it's perhaps enabled us to move more quickly into the lower age groups in in parts of the city region where where that progress has been has been made. So um, I think it's a positive thing um, and it actually plays to what I was saying at the weekend that in areas where uh, life expectancy is lowest, it does make sense to get down that age range as quickly as, as you can if you want to save more lives. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's a question from uh, Charlotte Cox, which relates to uh, some of the, the, the slide that you put up at the start of your remarks. In terms of lifting the lockdown, our rates are falling more slowly than the English average. So should the government be moving at the pace of the slowest area and should they be waiting until over 50s have been vaccinated before easing restrictions? Well, on your first question, Charlotte, yes. Um, it was the consensus uh, amongst um, uh, the leaders and, and myself yesterday. It, it does clearly make sense to move at the pace of the of the slowest. And the reason why that makes sense is because uh, we've seen how quickly things can change with the, the new strains of the virus uh, that we see much more transmissible. So um, that is why we're advocating that phase national uh, release uh, from from lockdown. Um, I don't think it necessarily follows that um, you have to keep all restrictions in place until uh, until all over 50s have been have been vaccinated. Um, I, I think that's something that the government will want to have have under under review, and we'll we'll need to see how the how the cases develop. I think once that has happened, then I think you can um, uh, then take take a, a perhaps a um, a more direct approach to, to re releasing restrictions because the, the top nine groups I think account for the vast major majority of uh, of mortality from COVID-19, I think 99 or 98%. So clearly once people are vaccinated um, that, that puts us in a different position, although we've got the, um, the issue of the new strains around and the potential uh, ability to evade uh, the vaccine. Uh, and the question of whether or not people who've been vaccinated uh, are less likely to, um, to, to, um, to pass on the virus and the science isn't yet clear on, 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 on that. So it's obviously confidence will build as we, as we, move, as we move through this. Um, but you know, sticking with the principle of phase national, I think, is, is, is what uh, we, we will strongly be, be calling for. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Richard or Bev, did either of you want to come in on that one? Just a very quick point is that uh, I think this also does depend very much, as Andy said, on the uh, uh, the evidence. It is still too early to see what the impact of vaccination has been with the top four groups, but probably uh, in another couple of weeks that we ought to have very clear evidence about whether what the impact of that has has been, and that should allow decisions to be made about uh, phasing of the lockdown if that's the approach the government's take, the, the approach we would like them to take. So uh, we should be having data relatively soon that will allow us to make evidence informed judgments about some of this. Thanks Richard. Babe, did you want to come in on that one at all? No, I think that's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Andy, a question from Katie, that's Manchester. What are your thoughts on longer school days? Now, Katie, I'm going to have to be careful how I answer this because it might cause an incident in my in my house uh, late, later on tonight. But um, I guess it, it, in principle, I can see the case for it. 
the practicalities of it, though, I think would be quite uh, quite complicated with regard to obviously people's um, uh, working uh, hours in school, teachers and support staff, um, the other services you need to have on site to open the school for longer. There's the whole question of school transport, um, which you know is is complicated at, at the best of times. So I, I think it, while it sounds good in um, in theory, in practice, more difficult. What I do support, though, would be to keep schools open for more extracurricular activity. Um, so for more sport, for more uh, music, uh, arts um, activities, and perhaps the continuation of online uh, events uh, for for um, for kids into the evening. So I think lengthening the school day is is complicated. I think to say the least. But providing more activities all uh, all day or into the evening, both on the school site and uh, digitally, I think is something I would strongly support. Thanks, Andy. Bev um, or Richard, did you, if you want to come in on that one. Bev. I think I think we've spoken before about there certainly needs to be a concerted effort to help uh, children recover uh, f from what they've lost during this lockdown and I think there's you know growing evidence uh, about that particularly disadvantaged children but also I think children more generally I, I know that the new commissioner that's been appointed to look into this has got a whole raft of measures being looked at not just um, lengthening the school day but what could happen during the school holidays and so on and they've, they've all got those issues uh, around them that uh, the mayor's the mayor's just just identified um, but but I think you know we, we definitely need some really clear and committed proposals to help children in the best possible way make up the ground that many many of them will have lost. Thanks Bev. You and Andy um, both spoke about cladding and there's a question here um, from Josh at Global Radio. Um, the Housing Secretary pledged a further 3.5 billion to try and tackle the problem with a loan programme. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in GM are obviously living in homes covered in dangerous material. Um, do you have any, he's asking what your reactions, have you any further reaction to what you've already said? Just, oh. Um. Andy, do you want to go first and then Bev? Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks Ross and thanks Josh. Um, I guess, you know, OK, something's been done here that will benefit a lot of people and we have to um, recognise that and um, to that extent be grateful that the government's listened um, because obviously it will help a lot of people in, in Great Manchester what's been announced uh, today. Frustration comes in uh, only offering partial solutions. So solutions for some people, but not for everybody. And as Bev and I have said today, there are thousands of people in unsafe buildings that fall below that 18 metre threshold. And if you just create a new injustice by shutting them out of the scheme and saying that they have to turn to a loan or or worse, live with unsafe cladding, it's just it's just not finishing the job. I mean, this is a serious issue uh, to leave people living in this position for so long after um, the, 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 the evidence of unsafe cladding came to light. You know, they are watching the Grenfell inquiry in the in the media like like we are, and I just don't think it's right to, um, to to draw a distinction between people in this way. All of the people, whether they're in a building below 18 or above 18, bought their homes um, with the legitimate um, knowledge that the home was safe. And I think they all um, should be supported. And it's for government and industry to work out how, how the cost of um, uh, making those homes safe will be met. Uh, it's really not for the residents to be worrying about that. So, as I say, it's 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 a difficult one because obviously we've made progress today, but it's as I say, new injustice arises, and um, really that's not what we we want to see right now. Thanks for bringing Bev on that point as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ross. To be honest, I think it's absolutely shocking. You know, if, if any of us buy an item that has been shown to be substandard and not fit for purpose when it was sold, then we'd be entitled to go back to the retailer or to the manufacturer uh, and, and get that, that get that fault dealt with or the item replaced. And I just fail to understand 
uh, why residents in, in homes, leaseholders, are not in that position. Um, it, it will need, even if that were the case, the government to, to, to come behind uh, any scheme because it, it's doubtful if industry, if, they, if the developers would be able to um, recompense people to the extent necessary and put these faults right in the timescale needed. But having said that, that should be the right of leaseholders in this situation. And therefore, the scheme, welcome though it is uh, fulfilling in part what's required, it falls so far short for so many, many people, thousands of people who've had untold worry about this, worry about the money and worry about the fact that they're living somewhere that's, that's absolutely unsafe uh, when they've seen the devastation that if a fire does start uh, can, can be caused through Grenfell and the Cube and, and other incidents. So, you know, the government really needs to step up and step up fully uh, to meet the needs of leaseholders in this situation. Thanks, Beth. I'm going to go to a question uh, from Can Dr. I Robert. just... Oh, sorry, Richard, of course. Yeah, it's kind of just sorry, quickly add, add to uh, add that, it's not least because uh, uh, Manchester City Council passed a, a resolution last week, which uh, uh, two of the city centre councillors uh, brought on, on this uh, very issue. I, what I want to add, add is it's uh, who, who is responsible that even the good builders were building according to standards set by central government. If it's government that set the standards, then it is them that are responsible and they need to accept that responsibility. Thanks, Richard. A um, question uh, from John Robinson at Business Live, which I put to Andy in the first instance, but uh, Richard, you may want to uh, come in on this one as well. Um, what would you like to see replace the spaces which are being vacated by the likes of Topshop and Burton across Greater Manchester? Oh, um, it's a good question, uh, John. Um, and Richard may have more thoughts on, on this than me because I'm, I'm sure he uh, is dealing with some of the issues that arise with regard to Debenhams and, and some other premises as, as our other leaders uh, with other retail spaces across the city region. I, I think, you know, fill them with a mix of uses is what I would say. Um, build on the success of the, the altering model where you see food markets, where you perhaps see more live music uh, within these these places. I think people come into city centres for much more varied reasons these days than uh, than retail. Um, and that's true of town centres as well. I, I think, you know, people want to come into a uh, kind of have a drink, have something to eat, you know, enjoy themselves. And I think there's an opportunity here to to rethink some of our some of our spaces, as well as looking at their residential potential, as I've, I've said before, because obviously if you bring in people to live in town or city centre, what you then see is a sort of knock on effect of them re-energising the local uh, the local economy. Uh, so, you know, it's challenging in the short term, but I think this can often help to the to the rebirth of some of our our, our towns and cities while feeling, of course, for all of the, the people employed um, by uh, Topshop, Burton, Debenhams and others uh, and through this. But it can in some ways be uh, an opportunity to, to rethink uh, rethink towns and cities and I'm sure that's what uh, Richard and colleagues at Manchester City Council are doing as well as colleagues in our districts. Bring in Richard on that point. Well I'm also uh, on a national task force looking at urban centre recovery as, as well and this is something we've uh, been discussing at a, a number of meetings now. Uh, it is a variety of, uh, of uses uh, certainly it gives potential for the growth of independent retail rather than national chain retail, certainly food and beverage. Uh, there is a risk as we have had in the last property crash of uh, uh, the empty high street. We need to be thinking about uh, interim uses that will be cultural uses, that will be community uh, uses. There is potential uh, uh, for that. There is also uh, commercial and public community uses. So GPs, dentists, uh, actually officers and, and so, so on. In some places, we will need to reduce the amount of retail space. And if we re take retail space out, then uh, converting shop fronts into residential is generally not a good idea. But if you can take, replace the buildings themselves and or, uh, refurbish them in a very different way, then certainly residential in town city centres is a really, really important step. So uh, it, it is a variety, but it is giving perhaps a character back to lots of our town centres and city centres 
uh, that they've lost over the last uh, 15, 15, 20 years, particularly by uh, bringing back the independence. So if you bring back the independence, every town centre becomes different. Thanks very much, uh, Richard. Uh, Andy, um, just going to go to um, a question from uh, Nigel Barlow. Um, your interview with the Sunday Times at the weekend certainly gave the impression that the distribution of the vaccine is becoming poor versus rich, a poor versus rich contest. Uh, can you explain the issue uh, you were attempting to portray? And do you believe that the central UK vaccination policy is being wrongly targeted? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Nigel. I don't know whether Richard wants to come in on this. I know Richard's got to go in a moment. So, um, shall I? I'll go go first. Not not a contest, uh, Nigel. No, I mean the JCVI has set out the um, the nine groups, and we've obviously uh, shown those today. What I was saying, though, if you go on age alone for the rest of the this phase of the vaccination program. You, you wouldn't, in my view, um, get to the people who are most vulnerable as, as quickly as possible, because the reality is in a number of our communities, people in their 60s or even in their 50s can have health that people in their 70s will have elsewhere. So the life expectancy in a number of our communities is, is lower. As I've said today, the level of infection in our communities has been higher. Um, throughout this pandemic uh, than we've seen in other parts of the country and one of the reasons for that of course is also that there's more people out at work in some of our some of our uh, poorest communities so if you if you take all of that and if you think about how do we save most lives yes kind of work through the jcpi's um, groups but there is a clear case to surge more supplies into areas where life expectancy is lowest um, because those people are in a uh, are, are in potentially a more vulnerable uh, position if you've got higher case rates within the community and more people out out at work um, the quicker you can get down those priority groups in areas of lowest life expectancy I believe you will end up uh, saving more lives and that is the argument that I was uh, seeking to make you know we've got kind of two things going on here haven't we we've got a call on the one hand from some saying Oh, we need a, a return to regional tiers so a regional approach to the restrictions but we'll have a national approach to the vaccine with all areas getting it equally and evenly at the same time well i think those two things are are in conflict aren't they the, the, the fact is there is a higher burden of disease in in some parts of the country and it's those parts of the country where life expectancy is lowest and it therefore makes sense to me to to ensure within the supplies that you've got to, to provide more in those areas because actually you will also potentially control the virus better nationally if those areas get, get more supplies. And it's been said to me this week that if you look at critical care in Greater Manchester, the average age of people in critical care in Greater Manchester tends to be lower uh, than, than um, the average age of people in hospital uh, in other parts of, of the country. And that again reflects the fact that um, we have a situation where people in their 50s and 60s often will have poorer health here uh, than you will see uh, in other parts of the country. Thanks, Andy. I'll bring in Richard. Well, I'm, I'll agree with what Andy said. This is very, very simple, really. The, the first phase of vaccination is aimed at, first of all, saving lives, and secondly, at taking the pressure off our health system, particularly intensive care. If that is the purpose, and I think that is the right purpose, then vaccinations ought to be targeted in the way that is going to maximise and the speed with which we do that. And that means that it does have to follow health inequalities. That's what the issue is. It's not poor versus uh, rich. It's about what's a problem, what's the best way of solving that problem. Thanks, Richard. Uh, a question for Andy um, from Jen Williams at the MEN. Uh, Andy, you said last week that you still have aspirations to be leader of the Labour Party. But you've said previously that you don't see Greater Manchester as a stepping stone in your political career and that you'd had enough of Westminster and didn't miss it. How can both be true? Thanks, thanks, Jen. Um, believe it or not, it is possible for, for both uh, to be true, as, as I'll try and explain. I, if you, you ask me honestly, do, do I have aspirations? Well, I've tried twice, so it's clear that I have had that aspiration uh, earlier in my life and if asked, do, do I have it? 
uh, it hasn't evaporated. But the second point is, do I ever expect it to come about? Well, no, uh, to be honest, I don't. Um, I can't see any uh, realistic way in which uh, in which it happens. And as I've said before, and, I, and I'll say it again, I expect this to be my last uh, job in politics. It's certainly not a stepping stone uh, to, to anything else. So that's how both statements are, are true. Of course, I've had an aspiration that has been there for a while. Um, I, I can't imagine how I would ever get the chance to, to try and pursue that aspiration again. Um, but uh, as I say, um, the, the job I'm in, I expect I expect to be uh, to be my last. But who knows what life what life throws up? But that's how both statements are are true. Thanks, Andy. Question from Kim Fitzpatrick at Radio Manchester for Bev first. Um, can, you can you tell us what tell percentage us of COVID fines are being paid? Reports nationally suggest it isn't many, and uh, I'll take the question from Andy uh, once you've uh, addressed that one. Yeah, th thank you, Kevin. Um, I think we're around the uh, national average for, for payment, which is around 50% uh, at my last my, my last reading of it. But I just make two points because I think that you know that might change because we've seen the introduction of much bigger fines under the fixed penalty notice system. I, I outlined some of them earlier when you know one owner was, was fined an accumulative seven thousand pounds. Uh, many students find £800 and we don't know yet because people have a, a certain amount of time to pay uh, what impact those larger fines uh, will have on people um, paying them. Uh, so that's one point. I, I think the other point is, to be honest, as, as we've seen uh, in different ways that th throughout, throughout this pandemic, um, the situation is now getting so complex. There's different fines for different size of gatherings and different sorts of events. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, that in a sense, it's that complexity, um, whilst the increased fine might might ensure more compliance in terms of not breaching the COVID regulations. Uh, I, I think it's also taking the edge off because I think it's just becoming so confusing for people. Thanks, Beth. A uh, question from Kevin to uh, Andy. Uh, replacement for the spatial framework likely begins on Friday. How will it be different to get the public on board, aside from being just the nine councils, not the ten? Um, well, I would like to think, Kevin, we have um, slowly brought the public back on board with the changes that we've made uh, in the recent iterations of the spatial framework. And the, the plan that was going through before Christmas contained further uh, changes that respond to what the public had been had been saying to us. It obviously then got stopped in its tracks as a plan of 10 uh, districts uh, by the decision in, in Stockport. But I, I think we have demonstrated that we've um, been able to uh, take on board uh, local concerns and, and listen. Uh, and I think there may yet still be further, uh, further small uh, changes in that direction uh, as, as well. So um, you know, it's still it's still the case that councils will have to have a a plan uh, to demonstrate how many um, to demonstrate that they can build the government's uh, homes target. And I've already seen that there are some difficulties already now in Stockport as a result of not being part of the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework and a kind of weakening of the um, of the position of of, of the um, of, of the planning department. So, you know, it's we. The leader of the Stockport Council warned about this, uh, as, as did we all at the time. Uh, and I think maybe the public will be able to see the risks of, of obviously stepping outside of the Greater Manchester, the Greater Manchester plan. So it's a, always will be a challenging process, no, no doubt about it. Um, but I think we have slowly um, shown how we can respond to public concerns and bring people back uh, back on board. Thanks, Andy. And the final question from Hannah Miller at Granada. Uh, Cheshire West Council said yesterday that they think that in 30% of cases, transmission is happening in the workplace. Do you have any similar statistics for Greater Manchester? And is there any more that could be done to drive down infections faster in the city region? Uh, I think it probably isn't dissimilar, uh, Hannah. Uh, I could double check the latest figures that, that we've got, but I think it will be similar uh, to, to that. Um, and workplace testing is obviously one way in which um, which uh, tr 
transmission can be controlled within workplace uh, settings. Uh, I do think we need to see a stronger approach from the health and safety executive than we've seen uh, so far. I think the rules around workplaces are too vague. Uh, it's still um, the rules talk of uh, two metre distancing being observed wherever possible, uh, which uh, leaves a very big loophole as far as I can see. So I, I think all through the pandemic, um, this has been a bit of a blind spot, to be honest. You might remember uh, last year when the first lockdown happened, a huge number of reports came flooding in from people who felt their workplace uh, was unsafe. And I don't think those issues have ever been uh, fully uh, fully addressed. I, I still think there potentially are, well, there are variable standards uh, in workplaces uh, across, across the country. And um, I think we needed firmer rules, uh, a stronger approach from the HSE, but also um, much greater use of workplace testing. And I think the government is now is now talking about that as well. And then if I could just make a final point on this, uh, Hannah, because this goes to the heart of what we were discussing with the 10 leaders uh, yesterday. We also critically need the link in that chain, test, trace, isolate, the isolate part to be to be properly put in place. Dido Harding said last week that 20,000 people every day are contacted by the National Test and Trace System and then they say they, they can't self-isolate, often for a direct financial reason or because they fear that they will have no job to return to because the job will just be taken off them if they if they were to do that. So presumably, well, not presumably, those people then will go into workplaces, obviously, uh, with a real risk of spreading it uh, to, to others. But, you know, you can't blame people when they are put in such a difficult choice uh, as as that. So that has to be fixed. And that is a strong message that we will be sending back to the government as part of uh, its uh, plans post national lockdown. You cannot have a position uh, any, any longer where with the new strains that we're seeing around where people potentially carrying those new strains are, are not being supported to stay at home and are then taking those new strains uh, into into work places. Uh, it, it's, um, it is irresponsible actually to, to allow this uh, situation to persist when it is so repeatedly been pointed out to the government and now we have NHS Test and Trace, uh, the head of NHS Test and Trace, defining the scale of this, of this, uh, of this problem. Uh, we believe we've improved testing in Greater Manchester and you've seen those figures today. I said last week that contact tracing has been improved with the input of our local teams but there is a major um, chink in the armour here, which is the, um, uh, the, the isolate piece uh, and the lack of proper simple support for people to self-isolate. And if we, if we don't correct that soon as part of the package of announcements that are coming, then um, we will have nobody but ourselves to blame if, this new, if these new strains and these new mutations um, start uh, gaining a hold in workplaces where uh, already there are some doubts about whether the, um, uh, the, the the rules are strong enough. So it's a really important question, Hannah. Uh, I think that we've always felt there needed to be more, more focus on workplaces that have stayed open right throughout the pandemic. Uh, and um, you know, we, we would probably say that the, the, the figure from Cheshire West, I will double check it, but I think it probably would be, it would be similar in Greater Manchester. Thanks, Andy. That's um, all today's questions. Um, so if you have any final um, thoughts or uh, we can finish. I'll turn to Bev first. Anything you'd like to add, Bev? No, I think that's been good. Thank you. I've got nothing to add. Good. No, uh, uh, from me, um, Ross, just to just to finish off by saying that um, we we are putting our, we are beginning discussions with the government now about what uh, what comes next. Um, we're obviously really pleased with the way vaccination um, has gone uh, so so far, but we think there are lessons that can be learned from 2020 now that will um, enable us to, to to deal with the re what remains of this year in a more orderly way. Businesses need the ability to plan, and they need a route map back. What they don't want is a stop-start approach with going into tiers, coming out of tiers. All the evidence suggests to us that. Um, to go back into the tier system uh, would, would bring back all of the um, the confusion and the, and the divisiveness that we saw 
uh, that we saw last year and we don't want to see uh, see a return uh, to it. So hopefully that message is, is really clear and um, we obviously uh, look forward to those discussions with the government. Um, with that, we will leave it there and thank you all uh, for attending. Apologies for the uh, for the interruption in the middle, but uh, thanks for bearing with us and we'll see you next week.